right here on VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Dan joins Dorothy Gundy to present this week's education report. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly tells us about the presidency of John F. Kennedy. But first, Brian Lynn has a report on updated COVID-19 vaccines. Pfizer has sought government approval for a new combination COVID-19 vaccine that aims to protect against new virus versions. The American drug maker officially requested the approval on Monday. The combination vaccine seeks to target new mutations of the Omicron version or variant of COVID-19. The latest mutations or sub-variants have been identified as BA.4 and BA.5. Omicron and another virus version, Delta, spread especially widely across the world. Research has shown that the two subvariants are better at avoiding the protection developed in people who were vaccinated or infected before. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, had ordered vaccine makers to target the BA.4 and BA.5 subvariants to prepare for new booster campaigns in the autumn. The two most widely used COVID-19 vaccines, one made by Pfizer and its partner BioNTech and the other by Moderna, have saved millions of lives worldwide. But medical researchers have urged drug companies to update their vaccines as the virus continues to mutate into new variants and subvariants. Pfizer-BioNTech aims to offer updated boosters to individuals 12 and older. The shots could begin within weeks if the FDA quickly approves the vaccine, the Associated Press reports. Moderna is expected to also seek government approval soon for a new combination vaccine. The United States has a contract to buy 105 million of Pfizer's shots and 66 million Moderna ones. It's going to be really important that people this fall and winter get the new shots, Dr. Ashish Jha told reporters last week. He is chief of COVID-19 policy for U.S. President Joe Biden. Ja added that the new combination vaccines are designed for the virus that's out there. Health officials say the BA.5 subvariant is currently causing almost all COVID-19 infections in the U.S. and much of the world. But health experts say there is no way to know whether it will still be a threat this winter or if another mutation will replace it. The vaccines currently used in the U.S. still offer strong protection against severe disease and death, especially if people have received booster shots. But those vaccines target the COVID-19 version that started widely spreading in early 2020. 
The current COVID-19 vaccines work by causing the production of antibodies that recognize and attack the so-called spike protein that surrounds the virus. The new combination vaccines will contain instructions for both the original spike target, as well as spike mutations carried by BA.4 and BA.5. I'm Brian Lynn. For nine-year-old Leah Rainey, the school day now begins with what her teacher calls an emotional check-in. It's great to see you. How are you feeling? A voice comes from her laptop. It asks her to choose an emoji that represents how she feels: happy, sad, worried, angry, frustrated, calm. Silly, tired. Depending on her answer, Leah gets a few more questions. Have you eaten breakfast? Are you hurt or sick? Is everything okay at home? Is someone at school being unkind? On a recent day, Leah chose silly, but she said she struggled with sadness. During online learning, Leah is in the fourth grade at Lakewood Elementary School in the American state of Kentucky. This year, all 420 students there will start their days the same way. The school is one of thousands across the United States using technology. To measure students' state of mind and warn teachers of anyone who might be struggling, the tool that Leah Rainey and other Lakewood students use for emotional check-in is called Close Gap. Rachel Miller is the founder of Close Gap. She said interest in the technology exploded because of the coronavirus pandemic. She said more than three thousand six hundred American schools will be using the technology this year. In some ways, this year marks a return to pre-pandemic normalcy in the U.S. Most school systems have lifted face covering requirements. Most have also ended social distancing rules, but the pandemic's long-lasting effects remain. Among them are the effects of loneliness and distant learning on children's emotional well-being. School systems across the country are using federal pandemic money to hire more mental health specialists. They are also using the money to expand classes. That deal with emotional health. The class, called social emotional learning, or SEL, has become the latest area of disagreement in education. Some American parents say SEL classes are used to teach ideas about race, gender, and sexuality, and they take time away from the more traditional classes. Azra Nomani is a parent from Fairfax County in Virginia. She said social emotional well-being has become an excuse to intervene in the lives of children in the most intimate of ways that are both dangerous and irresponsible. But educators say the class helps students deal with pressure and emotions, and it will help them in the classroom and life. Dan Dominetch is the executive director of the National School Superintendents Association. He said, "We are finally beginning to recognize that school is more than just teaching the kids reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
just as a hungry child cannot learn, Dominich added. A child with a troubled mind cannot pay attention to schoolwork. A recent report by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that 44% of high school students said they experienced feelings of sadness or hopelessness during the pandemic. President Joe Biden's administration recently announced over $500 million in assistance to expand mental health services in the country's schools. The money is in addition to federal and state money that schools have received to deal with pandemic-related needs. Claire Chi is an 11th grade student at State College Area High School in central Pennsylvania. She described the government's efforts as temporary. Last year, her school added emergency counseling and therapy dogs, among other supports. But most of that help lasted a day or two, Chi said. That's not really a mental health investment for students, she said. This year, her school has added more counselors and plans mental health training for all 10th graders. Many schools, however, are having trouble hiring counselors. Goshen Junior High School in northwest Indiana has been struggling to replace a counselor who left last year. Jan Desmares Morse, one of two counselors left at the school, said, One person trying to meet the needs of 500 students? It's impossible. The American School Counselor Association recommends having one counselor for every 250 students. But few states in the country have that. For the 2021 school year, only two states, New Hampshire and Vermont, met that goal. That information is based on data from the National Center for Education Statistics. The Associated Press found that some states have a very low number of counselors. Arizona averages one counselor for every 716 students. In Michigan, it is one for every 638 students. And in Minnesota, it is one for every 592 students. Lakewood Elementary School has used federal money to create take-a-break corners in each classroom. School counselor Shelley Kerr said students use the corner to learn to deal with concerns and worries. The school plans to build a reset room this autumn to create a safe area where students can speak with a counselor. Houston, Texas has one of the largest school systems in the country. There are 277 schools and nearly 200,000 students. Students are asked each morning to hold up their fingers showing how they feel. One finger means a child is hurting deeply. Five means they feel great. Houston teachers now give mindfulness lessons. Two dogs, a chihuahua named Lucy and a cockapoo named Omi, have joined the school system's crisis team. Houston also built relaxation rooms, known as thinkeries, at 10 schools last year. The rooms cost about $5,000 each. Data show that schools with these rooms saw a 62% decrease in calls to a crisis line last year. The school system says it is building more thinkeries this year. In Irvine, California, 
an artist was busy painting images on the wall of a room called a well space at University High School. The room is designed to have an unschool like feel. When school starts this week, counselors and mental health specialists will be in the well space to meet with students. The goal of the well space is to normalize the idea of students asking for help and to give students a place to reset. Tammy Blakely is the Irvine School System's Director of Student Support Services. She said if they can recenter and refocus, they can then, after a short break, go back into their classrooms and be prepared for deeper learning. I'm Dan Novak. And I'm Dorothy Gundy. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He was also known as Jack Kennedy, or by the letters JFK. When he took office in 1961, Kennedy was 43 years old. He was the youngest elected president in United States history. Kennedy was also the first Catholic to be elected U.S. president. Kennedy's youth and religion raised questions in the minds of some Americans that Kennedy could lead the country. They wondered if he would always follow the policies of the Roman Catholic Church. But Kennedy became well-known as a statesman and popular with people around the world. He was intelligent, funny, and good-looking. For many, Kennedy was a sign of new energy and hope. The public was shocked then when the president's term was violently cut short. John F. Kennedy was born in 1917 near Boston, Massachusetts. He was the second of nine children. Both his parents were Catholic, with ancestors from Ireland. Many years ago, Irish Catholics faced discrimination in the United States. But the Kennedy family was also politically powerful and wealthy. As a result, Young Jack Kennedy grew up in big, beautiful houses and received a top-quality education. His family did not suffer during the Great Depression, as many Americans had. Instead, the Kennedy children swam, sailed boats, and played sports. Jack also enjoyed reading books and following the news. His older brother Joe wanted to enter politics But Jack said he might become a teacher or writer. When he was a college student at Harvard, Jack wrote a long paper about Britain in the years leading up to World War II. A version of it was published in 1940 as a book. The war changed Jack's thinking about his future plans. During World War II, both Jack and his older brother joined the U.S. Navy. In the Pacific, Jack became a hero. He won medals for leading some of his troops to safety after a Japanese warship struck a boat they were on. But Joe was killed. In 1944, his airplane exploded over Europe. When the war ended, Jack's father urged him to follow his brother's dream of succeeding in politics. Jack agreed and he set his sights on becoming the country's first Catholic president. Kennedy was nominated as the Democratic Party's candidate, 
and he was elected in 1960. He easily defeated Vice President Richard Nixon, the Republican candidate, in the Electoral College. But Kennedy won only narrowly in the popular vote. Though he was young, Kennedy brought experience to the job. In addition to being a naval officer, Kennedy had been a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, as well as a senator from Massachusetts. He also published a Pulitzer Prize-winning book called Profiles in Courage. And he had become a husband and father. He married a wealthy, well-educated woman who had been working as a newspaper photographer. Her name was Jacqueline Bouvier, but she was sometimes called Jackie. She became pregnant five times, but only two of her children would survive, a daughter named Carolyn and a son, John F. Kennedy, Jr. The family of four moved into the White House in January 1961. On the day he was sworn in, Kennedy gave a speech that many people still remember today. It celebrated the new generation of Americans and promised to pay any price for liberty. Supporters of the new president loved his energy and sense of hope. In his most famous line, Kennedy said, Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Many young people remembered that line when they volunteered for a program Kennedy created in 1961, the Peace Corps. Other Americans remembered the line when they watched two Apollo 11 astronauts walk on the moon in 1969. Kennedy strongly supported the country's space program. He promised that Americans would land on the moon by the end of the 1960s, and they did. Kennedy also supported efforts to improve civil rights across the U.S., although his administration moved slowly. Calls to end legalized racism were growing stronger during Kennedy's time in office, particularly because of the leadership of Martin Luther King, Jr. In June of 1963, King spoke to hundreds of thousands of people at a civil rights protest called the March on Washington. He told the crowd that he dreamed, My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. The March on Washington, among other events, showed the power of the civil rights movement. In late 1963, President Kennedy sent a civil rights bill to Congress and spoke to Americans about the injustice that remained in the country. The Peace Corps, the space race, and civil rights are all part of Kennedy's legacy. Kennedy is also remembered for several troubling international events. In one, known as the Bay of Pigs, Americans supported Cuban refugees in an effort to oust the government of Fidel Castro. Not only did the refugees fail, but Kennedy's government was found to be lying about their support of the effort. And Kennedy faced off with the leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev. In 1962, American leaders learned that the Soviets had hidden nuclear weapons in Cuba. The missiles would be able to reach the U.S. mainland easily. Kennedy ordered a blockade of Cuba. People around the world held their breath as they waited to see if the U.S. and the Soviet Union would launch a nuclear war. They did not. After several very tense weeks, Kennedy and Khrushchev reached an agreement that ended the crisis. Kennedy went on to reach an agreement with the Soviet Union and Britain to limit nuclear weapons testing. He said the agreement was one of the presidential acts of which he was most satisfied. Historians still debate Kennedy's actions and what else might have happened during his presidency. 
They wonder especially what he would have done about the increasing conflict in Vietnam. But Kennedy did not live to finish his first term. By November 22, 1963, Kennedy had been president for just under three years. The next election was still a year away, but it was time to start campaigning again. So the president and his wife went to Dallas, Texas, to connect with voters. They were riding in a car with other official vehicles that drove slowly through the center of the city. Jack, Jackie, and the Texas governor and his wife sat in a convertible, an automobile without protection over the seats. The president was waving at the crowd. Suddenly, several gunshots were fired. The president was struck twice. The governor was also hit and injured. Kennedy was hurried to a hospital, but doctors were unable to help him. News reporters announced his death to a stunned public. Hours later, Jackie Kennedy appeared next to the former vice president, now president, Lyndon Johnson. She still wore the clothes with her husband's blood on them. The events remain intense in the minds of many Americans who were alive at the time. The images remain easily recognizable parts of American history. The pictures of Kennedy's family at his funeral are especially memorable. In one, three-year-old John holds up his arm and salutes his father's casket. Attention quickly turned to the gunman. It was reportedly a 24-year-old man named Lee Harvey Oswald. Shortly after the president and the governor were shot, Oswald shot a policeman who questioned him. Oswald was eventually detained. Officials planned to bring him to court for the death of the president and the policeman. But on the way from the police station to the jail, a local nightclub owner shot and killed Oswald. As a result, the case never came to trial. Many Americans believe the reason for the attack has yet to be clarified. Historians have a mixed reaction to Kennedy's years as a president, although their opinions are generally positive. His image with the public suffered some years after his death because of reports that he had romantic relationships with women other than Jackie throughout his marriage. In time, the public also learned about Kennedy's health problems. He suffered from severe back pain, and Addison's disease. He often used strong medicine to help control the conditions. The health problems are at odds with Kennedy's image of health and love of sports. Yet even with these new details, Kennedy is still one of the country's best-remembered leaders. He was a charismatic man whose career influenced many other Americans to enter public service. Americans also remember his stylish, cultured wife. Jackie Kennedy compared the Kennedy years at the White House to Camelot, the legendary court of King Arthur. Their remains, along with those of two of their children, are buried at Arlington National Cemetery, across the Potomac River from Washington. They are honored there with an eternal flame, one designed so the fire will never go out. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. 
I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 